come up with our <clears throat> this is an outdoor instrument so you know indoor I, I always have fun especially when I demonstrate this to uh, little children I'm like uh -huh. I'm kind of putting them out here and swinging around says I gotta be careful where I carry the swing it's just it's just bulky. The average well, well the traditional alcorn is made out of on the side of the mountains, just about close to Timberline. And the angle on the bottom here, I'm sure you've been hiking a lot, so if you had the angle of a hill growing up like this, I'm trying to get, okay, there's my tree chart, and this is the angle of the side of the mountain. That bend in the bottom, you wouldn't find traditionally more, you wouldn't find two alcorns with the same bend on it, because that's the bend of the tree coming out. They cut it right off at ground level. Now they make them more uniformly, but it's still made out of wood, although some uh, machinery manufacturing goes into it. Traditionally, they would cut the tree, and being a high altitude spruce, that means for about the first four, five, six foot, there's no branches there because the snow would be covering that much of the tree most of the year, so no branches would grow up from that point up. And then farther up, they would trim those branches, they would slice the tree right down the middle in half, carve it out, put it back together, glue it together, wrap it in bark, twine, cord, rattan, whatever was available at the time, and it would be one piece. Of course, they wouldn't be transporting it very much because it was a summertime or a winter job that they were doing there. And it would be stored in this alpine home, village, whatever, above the mountains. Now they come nicely apart in three pieces, four foot long. This particular one, I have my F um, length in here. The Swiss like to refer to their horns playing in the key of G flat because they say the higher pitch means more purely in the alpine air. But that means that no one else can play along with them or they can't play along with anyone else because face it, G flat, F sharp, who's going to mess around with seven sharps and six flats? It's just very tough music. So we do have an F extension usually that comes with this. My uh, G flat is just about four and a half, five inches short to give you just that pitch on there. So in playing on this, and this being a long one, this is my F extension. And I'll even away from everyone. And I, I have only on occasion, very rarely been able to hit my fundamental. Usually it's the second partial or the second note off in the harmonic series. Which for on horns is that C in bass clef. Now if you drop down lower and get that fundamental C, which is basically your F pitch, then you're hitting your fundamental. But starting with your second partial going up.
rewarding for what? No, no, no. Ah, okay. But just don't pay any attention. Okay. And so going from here, with the overtone series, I gave you a uh, insert or, or a sheet on that. It gives the overtone series. So you see what's meant by partials and harmonics. Harmonics are religiously in tune. You play a note, you're going to have harmonics going over from that note. It's, it's the law of physics. Partials, however, in each one of those pitches that I played on there, that's what we refer to as partials. And you can bend and move those notes. Now we come up to the French hunting horn. This is a French hunting horn. This is keyed in D. So this is a little over 14 feet long. Originally when they started this, giving you some of the history of the hunting horn, it's been long known that longer tubes produce different notes from a shorter one. But a preference also had arisen for blowing on a slender pipes rather than the short and massively thick cow horns type things. By the early 17th century, metallurgy had advanced to the point where skilled instrument manufacturing was possible. So since materials were now crafted uh, from metal, you could bend them, they didn't have to rely on their natural shapes. And the use of longer metal hunting horns did not take place until the 18th century and 1700s. The aristocracy and nobility of Europe controlled these. As Larry Lowe last week had talked about, you had to have a license or you had to be permitted to have one of these. Even owning one of these could be a capital offense because these were used so much and they were so important for carrying signals audibly over long distances. Only the people who knew how and knew these codes were allowed to carry. It's like having access to military communications nowadays. Only those who are authorized are allowed to do so. Now, known in Germany as the Parforce horn, and in France, the La Dampierre, after the Marquis de Dampierre, who was master of the hunter's majesty, King Louis XV, the early 18th century horn was used in the hunt to relay signals. The differences between the French and the German is the one that we have now. Originally, the French started out what they call a one and a half turn. Basically, it was that really big loop thing that you saw, and it just kind of went once around like this, only it was about a meter and a half in diameter, which would be equivalent about four feet across. And they could hang it over themselves and the like. It reduced eventually down into size. The German hunting horn, the par force horn, was keyed in E flat, the French keyed in D. Why? Preferential, I guess. It, was finally reduced down to and is now standard size is what we call the three and a half turns. And it's called the De Orleans, named uh, after, let's see, I'm trying to remember who, some count king something or another, I forgot who, and I should have had it in here. Oh, there we go. Uh, Somewhere in here, you probably see it before I have it listed down. There we go. The hunting horn used to is La De Orleans. Comes on change down into here. The guy ordered, he was uh, someone in royalty. He ordered uh, an inordinate amount of these for his hands. He ordered an inordinate amount of these to, for his court. And it's been on this. And these things are played very differently from the horns we know today. First of all, it's a conical deep bore mouthpiece. It has a thin rim, and basically you play it with one lip. What you do is you put it, set it on your bottom lip. Your upper lip, two thirds of it, goes inside the mouthpiece, and the remaining space on that opening, your tongue fills the gap. So basically, you have your upper lip playing in here, and I can't do it yet. 
Uh, it is something, but this gives the horn a distinct sound, and although I can play this like a typical horn sound, and when they do play this, they don't face the audience, the bells face the audience. I have to get my pitch on this here. Thank <laughs> you. 